ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد ان محمدا عبد الله ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا اوصيكم ونفسي بتقوى الله عز وجل كما جاء في محكم التنزيل يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما Dear brothers and sisters we always begin with praise and gratitude and that leads us directly into our subject of today We have to as believers first and foremost come to know God almighty If we know who it is that we are dealing with and then we take the second step of the one we are truly dealing with every day which is our own selves then we can feel comfortable about what we're doing in life and what is going to happen to us when we leave this earth these are the two fundamental qualities of understanding faith who is the my creator and what is my relationship to him and what will happen to me based upon that so today we're going to talk about a very extensive subject and we're going to try to crunch it up into a very small sermon that we can go living here with a lifestyle perhaps a lifestyle change and sometimes you may have heard a khutbah or have learned something but you have stopped practicing that and that is the value of reminders the whole entire quran is called adhikri the reminder that which brings you back to what is important what you need to know the thing you need to remember so we have wronged ourselves as the human race we have wronged ourselves when allah azza wa jal talks about the reality of the beginning of mankind it is this offering of all of the responsibility of choice and self determination and all of the creations of the universe said we don't want any part of that the human being by nature every last one of us we said we've got this one we can handle this and then what allah said innahu kana zaluman jahula Indeed, the reality of mankind is that we have been oppressive and unjust and ignorant and foolish when it comes to carrying this huge trust and responsibility of knowing reality, of taking part in the conscious decision making, knowing good and well, cause and effect, and our role therein. So, what makes us special? is going back to understanding the famous story that comes up time and time in the, in the Quran and that is when God told the angels and iblis a jinn among them all of you should bow down in respect to this creation Adam and Satan said no I will not do it I am better I was created before and until this day that we are sitting here god only knows how long that's been he is still believing that he's right he is that is that is the depth of the deep roots of arrogance it leads to a form of oppression and injustice and ignorance and foolishness like that so we humans have followed him to a certain extent but look what our forefather and his wife Hawa, Adam and Eve, what they said. Qala Rabbana Dalamna Anfusana wa illam tawfid lana wa tarhamna lana kunan min al khasirin. The difference between Iblis, Satan, 
and mankind is that which will come in this supplication. They said, they called out after they had known that they have clearly broke the law of God. They said, our Lord, we have wronged ourselves. If you don't forgive us and show us mercy, we will have lost everything. And so that's the nature of humanity. Some people try to picture it that because of Adam or because of Adam and Eve, we're all now going through this difficult life. Whether it was me or you or your mom or your dad or your brother or your sister, every last one of us would have eaten from that tree. That is who we are. But what makes us great and what separates us from the devil is that we will seek his forgiveness. We have to know whose hands we're in. Let my servants know that my reality in deep emphasis is surely, truly that of forgiveness and mercy. And he says, وَرَحْمَتِي وَثِعَتْ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ And my mercy and compassion encompasses everything. So the Prophet told his people, فَقُلْتُ اسْتَغْفِرُوا رَبَّكُمْ إِنَّهُ كَانَ غَفَّارًا I said to the people, seek the forgiveness of your Lord. He will forgive everything. قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْنَطُوا مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ جَمِيعًا إِنَّهُ هُوَ الْغَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ He says, say to my servants who have done all kinds of sins, they have destroyed their soul. I forgive all sins. Do not become hopeless of the mercy of God because He's talking to you directly. He will forgive all your sins. That is His nature. So if we understand that from the Quran, we look into the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. And there are some profound hadith that some people when they hear it, because their idea of religiosity is tainted with human judgment, with rigidity. So the hadith in Sahih Muslim, that it's a famous hadith Qudsi, the Prophet ﷺ said that God has said, child of Adam, talking about every one of us individually, as long as you call upon me, and you hope in my forgiveness, then I will have no problem forgiving all of your sins regardless of how much and how big they are. He says, child of Adam, if your sins were stacked up to the highest of the sky, and you seek my forgiveness, I will forgive you. Child of Adam, if you fill this whole earth up with your sins, and you come to me, Seeking my forgiveness without having associated in your beliefs and in your practice others with me, then I will be ready and willing to forgive you the whole earth of sins. This is an unquestionable hadith. In another hadith that all of the scholars have agreed is authentic in Sunan al Tirmidhi, he says, This is another hadith where Allah says, My servant has sinned. And he calls upon me, Oh God, please forgive my sin. Then God will say, This is my servant. He has sinned and he knows that he has a Lord who will either account him for that sin or forgive him for that sin. And so he says that he will forgive him all of his sins. So do as you will because I have forgiven you your sins. Do as you like because I have forgiven you. Now obviously do as you like is not talking in the future tense. 
It's in the past tense. I have forgiven you for it. What he's saying is, if you know him and you know yourself, and you know his message, and you come to know your shortcomings, and you feel wrong, you feel bad, you wish you have not done that, you know you should not have done that. He is saying, that's all I want from you. Somebody asked the Prophet ﷺ, what if there were people who didn't sin? He said, then I will erase the earth of those people and bring people who will sin and seek my forgiveness. Now some of you might think when you hear this, what is this? First of all, that is a parable. Obviously everyone sins. But what he's saying is what's important is that you know your imperfection. And you know that you came from perfection. And you know that he's inviting you back to him and he will remove from you all of your imperfections if you simply seek it from him. So some people say, why were we put in this test of life? Number one, the ayah says, we asked for it. Ask everyone you know, would you rather have not been born? Would you rather be an animal who does not, understand, who does not recognize self? I was talking to a Hindu guy once. He said, I hope I don't become an animal in my next life. Or like an ant or something. Somebody squashed me. Nobody wants to be an animal. People want to be people. We're on a power trip. I want to be in control of my life. I want to know and think that I'm in control. Guess what? If you realize in fact you are not in control with your conscious decision and you know who is, فَلَا حَوْلَ وَلَا قُوَّةَ إِلَّا بِاللَّهِ Then you will get close to him and he will bring you back into him. What are the conditions? There are conditions to complete and absolute forgiveness. الَّذِينَ يَجْتَنِبُونَ كَبَائِرَ الْإِثْمِ وَالْفَوَاحِشَ إِلَّا الْلَّمَمْ إِنَّ رَبَّكَ وَاسِعُ الْمَغْفِرَةِ so it says, who are the people who will be forgiven? They are those who avoid the major, hugely consequential sins. And they will only fall into minor sins. And indeed, if you take this path, your Lord is extensively over-encompassing everything with His forgiveness. So what is a major sin? In the Qur'an and the Sunnah, we have certain things that will tell you what is a major sin. If it says, whoever does this is going to the hellfire, or will be punished, or has some worldly punishment, or those people are not from among us, or the curse of God. Anytime it mentions a sin, and it's like this, that's a major sin. Other than that, scholars have differed. Is this disliked or is it a minor sin? Safe to say, let's understand it to be a minor sin to be safe in our faith. So the first is polytheism. Polytheism is truly being devoted that your number one priority is something other than God. It's not necessarily that you're worshipping a statue. You could be worshipping your own self. You could be worshipping your business. You could be worshipping your family. You could be worshipping your clothing. You could be worshipping your Facebook account. Whatever is the ultimate devotion that you have in life, your number one priority, the thing that means most to you above all else, is that which you worship. So Tawheed is not some give me. It's not a gimme. It's something that requires intrinsic reflection of intention and purpose and focus and priority. Second, murder. To kill someone. The only, whenever it says, illa bil haq, except with just right, you have to memorize this because people will say, your religion teaches killing people. You say no. Our scholars have commented on verses that say, Murder is forbidden. 
Except with just right, you cannot kill anyone. Just right, as an individual, someone is trying to kill me. Someone is coming with some sort of force that could kill me, and so I do something to defend myself, and I kill them. I'm not a murderer. I have killed them justly. As a state, you have your army intended to fight a just war, to protect you from invaders or occupiers or whatever. Or your neighboring land is being oppressed and tyranny, you have the means to stop that oppression, so you take care of that. Or capital punishment, someone who's done a crime, the divine law, or respecting the law of the land that's not divine law, they have that right, that's their country. Those are the ways that somebody may be killed. There is absolutely no basis, no scholar has ever suggested or allowed, and it is completely contradicting the religion, this thing that they call honor killing. This is dishonoring your soul and murdering a human being unjustly. This cultural thing that is not specific to Muslims, People in, you know, Japan and elsewhere in the world, China, even in South America, they had it on the books till the 1970s in a Catholic state, okay? That whoever murdered their wife because they felt like, you know, they were adulterizing or whatever it may be. There is no basis for this. Whoever thought that because my child or sister or wife or whoever, that they're doing something that I feel is wrong, that I have the right to harm one hair on their head, that person is gravely mistaken about the religion of Islam. Killing yourself. Major sin. One of the most terrible things you can do because now you're done and that's how you... Al-Ibra uh, Bil-Khawateen. The last thing you've done, the reality you were when you left this life, is what is most important about you. That is why we are told to work on our faith every day. God is not playing some game and then He waits till you almost die and then causes you to become a disbeliever. The hadith is warning you not to let your guard down so that that happens to you by your own foolishness. So when you know you're doing something that could kill you, you should avoid that. So there is no basis in Islam for someone to kill themselves trying to blow up an enemy in a war or in, for sure not in some sort of civilian setting. No basis. Absolutely wrong. Absolutely forbidden. Ayahs and hadith are all against that. So whoever said there is something called amaliyat al-ishtashadiyah, trying to beautify the words, this is absolutely false. There is no basis for this in our religion. You cannot kill yourself. Being content with sin, this is a major sin. To know that you're sinning, even if it's not a major sin, and you're totally cool with it, you're comfortable with it, that is a major sin. Dishonoring, disrespecting your parents. It doesn't mean to disagree with them. This is the, I will tell you, in the culture, many Muslim parents use Birr al-Walidain to oppress children. See, you are my slave. You must do everything. You can never have an opinion even if you're a grown adult with your life ahead of you. You have to respectfully, lovingly, kindly, and gently, if you're going to disagree with them as an adult, disagree with them. As a kid, you have to obey them no matter what. You are in their house. They are your guardians. And so this is one of the major sins, to disrespect and dishonor and offend and harm your parents. It is wrong for a parent to try to use this as some sort of selfish control mechanism. This is oppression, which is also a major sin. Disconnecting the ties of the womb, turning your back on your family, your close family, is a major sin. Something that should be avoided at all costs. Fornication is a major sin. Adultery obviously is a major sin. Should be avoided at all costs. That is why there are certain laws and rules in Islam that if someone follows them, they can not. So somebody might say, it seems pretty strict. No, it is protecting you from yourself. 
Because you don't clearly know yourself if you think that's strict. Because all of the statistics of human history would say, if you start a said type of relationship, you will fall into fornication and adultery. This is the facts of numbers. Arrogance and self-pride. This is probably the most common major sin done by Muslims, even very religious good Muslims. They fall in this one, they don't even realize it. Because arrogance is the big trick of the devil. You think you're right, you think everything you do is right in your way and your thinking and all of that. So you start to oppress people, you start to reject the truth. Batal haqq wa nas, as the Prophet said. Because you're so proud of yourself. Humility is the essence of good character. Oppression. When you have the means of authority and then you are being unfair and causing harm and serious discomfort to someone under your authority because of your selfish desire to have it your way. Whether it be greed, whether it be abuse, physical, emotional, verbal, those type of things. That's oppression. It's a major sin. Wallahu la yuhibbul zalimin. Wallahu la yahdi al-qawm al-zalimin. He does not love them. He is not guiding them. Bearing false witness. To say that happened, this is what was going on, and you know that is not true. And bearing false witness is like somebody's asking you in a situation of, we need to know what happened there. We need your testimony about what happened. And you say whatever you say, either to save yourself or to buddy up with someone who's saying what you're about to say because you're on their side. This is a major sin. Alcohol and intoxicants. Things that ruin your mind, things that make you make bad decisions and cause so many problems. The statistics are there. Somebody say, well I can just drink a one glass or one beer and I'm in control. There are millions of people in world history whose lives were ruined and the way they started was, I can control myself. So Allah knows very well what's in our best interest and He's telling us, avoid the whole thing altogether. Theft, over $40. To take something, now theft is not, theft is, some people misunderstand it. If it's in a place, that is protected, let's say fi harzan. It's taken from a place that you had to do something to get in there to take it. And it's more than $40, which is the nisab, that is a major sin. Giving or taking bribes. Now some people are saying, because I lived in the Muslim world, and many circumstances, unfortunately, in the government system of trying to just give my residency Continue, people start suggesting this to me. And I'm like, Brother, I just saw you at the mosque yesterday. What are you talking about? This is a very serious thing. But unfortunately, corruption is there and we have to avoid it and work against it. Backbiting and slander. To say things about people that is harmful to them. The Prophet said, La yadkhul jannata nammam. One who would say, this person said or did this and they know they didn't do it, but they know what's going to happen is, those people are not going to like that person. That person does not go to heaven. It's one of the most strongest prohibitions of any action. Backbiting is, it's actually true what you said about them. And there is no benefit going to come from, for that person for you to tell other people exactly what actually was said or done or the reality of that person. The only reason you could is if you're genuinely going directly back to that person concerned about them, something they've said, done or is doing, trying to help them, or you know that you've tried that or it won't work because you know you talk to someone really close to them individually for the sole purpose of helping fix their problem. Other than that, backbiting is a major sin. To say what is true about someone or something outside of their presence and what's probably going to happen is people aren't going to like that person. Causing harm to your neighbor. If your neighbor feels like, 
I'm bothered by my neighbor. And you're the neighbor? This is a major sin until you fix it. Until they think otherwise about you. It's very serious. That's why we have two sermons uh, in the first place. Loving the enemies of Islam and trying to side with them, seek their support. This is a major sin. Basically, if there is a group of people who by their general identity as a collective, they're saying, the Muslims are this and that, and Muslims are another Islam. And, and you're like, but I want to be on your side. I think there's some financial or political gain I can get by siding with you or liking you or seeking your help. This is a serious major sin. And the last is to divide the Muslims. To try to pit Muslims against each other. We're right, they're wrong. My madhab's right, my shaykh's right, yours is wrong. Those are all wrong because their opinion is this. And therefore, we don't like them. This is a big sin. So, we have to be very careful not to fall into these major sins. What does the Qur'an tell us in summary? The believers who will be forgiven for these major sins are those that when they realize it, they know they're wrong because they know the revelation. They know what Allah and His Messenger وسلم, have said about this. And so they're feeling bad, I've done that. Number one. And then secondly, they're like, I have to stop doing this right now. I don't know how many times I asked a brother who's in the process of backbiting or smoking or lying or something. Like, come on, brother, astaghfirullah, we're better than this, man, let's, let's not do that. Insha'Allah. No, Allah has willed for you not to do that. You are consciously making a decision to do it. And if I pray for you, hopefully that will benefit you in some way. But until you decide not to do that, you are sinning. And that's the saying, insha'Allah, and asking for prayers is actually some sort of playing with the religion and disgracing your soul, is what you're doing. It's a superficial religion. So we have to be genuine and honest with ourselves and with God. So the reality is that once they put that down, they take measures. They seek God's forgiveness and then they try to avoid that sin. I'm going to stay away from this sin. I'm going to try to avoid this sin. And that means I need to avoid the people who do it and the places it happens. If I go, if I say, Allahumma khfirli, Rabbi khfirli, because I was doing such and such. Then I go hang around people who do such and such. And then I start doing such and such, that was not real tawbah. Because I'm putting myself in the situation to do it. Which is valuman and jahula. You're oppressing yourself with foolish ignorance. You would not do that. I came to the epiphany. When I had embraced Islam by reading a translation of Qur'an in 1998. But my lifestyle was against the Qur'an in a hundred ways at that point. After a year of struggling with my hypocrisies in my newfound faith and belief, and then finding a mosque, everybody there was kind of weird. I couldn't remember their names. Culturally strange. But the general reality of them is that they're sincerely there seeking the pleasure of God and they're seeking to form a community of people who are serious about that. So I knew, is it going to be easy to just transition or should I make this jihad and separate myself from those people and those circumstances that I had become accustomed to living in because I'm concerned about my soul and what will happen to it. So I made that move. And it was a short struggle. I became comfortable with my fellow believers within, I'm going to say, six months. But for six months, it was like trying to understand people. They're using all these Arabic words I don't know. Sometimes some of them seem a little bit nitpicky and stuff like that. But overall, I realized I'm on a mission. And I cannot allow these people's uh, strangeness or perhaps their shortcomings to take me away from God and religion because this is the place that it's going to happen. You have to make that conscious decision. So, what is the attitude of the believer? If you get angry, the Quran says, 
you must forgive the one you're angry at. Why? Because we do things that earns the displeasure of Allah. We want His forgiveness. So the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Man la yaghfir la yughfallah. Who is not forgiving will not be forgiven. So do not hold a policy of selfish pride and control about how you deal with others and you're expecting from Allah some dealing. كَمَا تَدِينُ تُدَانِ As one of the, many of the Sahaba have said, as you deal with people, you will be dealt with by Allah. It sounds a little bit Buddhist there. It's kind of like karma. There is eternal karma for the way you live your life and how you deal with people. This is Islam. So, that is the attitude of the believer. The attitude of the believer, there is something called Sayyidul Istighfar. We don't have time, but go ahead and study it on your own. The master of seeking forgiveness. In essence, you call upon him who you know as your creator, provider, sustainer, lord, cherisher, provider and all of that. And you say, you know what, I'm wrong, I admit my sins and my shortcomings, and I admit that you are the one who has given me everything in life and all that I cherish and love. So forgive me because if you don't forgive me, I'm lost. As our forefather Adam and Eve have said. So, what is the fruits of seeking forgiveness? وَإِنِ اسْتَغْفِرُوا رَبَّكُمْ ثُمَّ تُوبُوا إِلَيْهِ يُمَتِّعْكُمْ مَتَاعًا حَسَنًا If you seek His forgiveness and truly repent to Him, the Qur'an, it's a Qur'anic formula for believers. This is only for believers. Non-Muslims, يُمَتِّعْهُمْ For all of them, no matter what they do, he can, whoever got wealthy, get wealthy, no problem. For a Muslim, wealth is going to increase. Worldly value will increase with seeking forgiveness. I'm not saying that, that's what the Qur'an said. And that's what all the scholars of Tafsir said about this ayah. You seek his for he will increase you benefits in this world. In another ayah, يُرْسِلَ السَّمَاءَ عَلَيْكُمْ نِدْرَارَ وَيُمْدِدِكُمْ بِأَمْوَالِ وَبَنِينَ You seek his forgiveness, he will make sure that all kind of great things, you know, the rain will come down, the fruits and vegetables and the goodness of the vegetation will benefit you. And then he will increase you and wealth and children. This is what it says, if you do what? If you seek his forgiveness. The Prophet ﷺ was seeking forgiveness 70, 100 times a day. Is that a specific number or does it mean a whole lot regularly? It means a whole lot regularly. Obviously people were not counting with the Prophet ﷺ. Okay, that's one. What it means is that was his lifestyle. Why? Because he's a sinner. One time the Christians came to my door, come to visit me. What did you say about Jesus? Is he sinless? Yes, he's sinless. Okay, see, we know that. But your prophet sinned at least 70, 100 times a day. And I was like, are you telling me what my religion teaches? Because I don't want to tell you what your religion teaches. I'll respect you and whatever you think about your own religion. And that's your business. What we understand from the scholars is the prophet is teaching us a mode and a methodology to deal with the world that we're living in. Because we will leave this world. So we see sins. They happen. Astaghfirullah. Don't become content with it. Don't normalize sinful behavior because the world is moving in that direction. Gharban musharqan. This is the way we are. That's what's happening. That's what goes on. So astaghfirullah. A'udhu billah. Be like that. Continue to think like that. The Prophet is not sinning, but he sees sinful things. Some thoughts that he has, maybe he's uncomfortable with them. Astaghfirullah. Doesn't mean he's done some sin. This is the way, the attitude of the believer. So he says, وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ مُعَذِّبَهُمْ وَهُمْ يَسْتَغْفِرُونَ Here is why this sermon is so important. We will conclude on this point. He says in the Qur'an, talking about a people who would be destroyed for their sins. He would not destroy the people or torture them as a nation. If indeed they were genuinely living the lifestyle of seeking divine forgiveness. Now I'm asking you, are we really living this life? If I was to ask you, should you seek forgiveness? You would have all said yes. But as an ummah, are we truly, as a collective, living the life seeking forgiveness? مَا كَانَ اللَّهُ مُعَذِّبَهُمْ وَهُمْ يَسْتَغْفِرُونَ وَاللَّهُ عَلَىٰ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ 
فَعَالُ لِمَا يُرِيدِ Whatever we see with us, we need to turn back to Him and seek His forgiveness. Say, so we keep making these deep prayers in the Haram and Ramadan and the Qunut. فَاسْتَغْفِرُوهُ ثُمَّ تُوبُوا إِلَيْهِ إِنَّهُ إِنَّ رَبِّي قَرِيبٌ مُجِيبٌ Seek His forgiveness. Turn to Him in repentance. Then He will become very close to you and be with you and He will answer your prayers. We can all oh, this and Philistine and all of that. What happened? Why? Are we truly living the life of Istighfar? أقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم فاستغفروا فإنه هو الغفور الرحيم. بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. In conclusion, the hadith of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم it's authentic. There's no question about it. Satan has declared, I will continue. To mislead the children of Adam as long as their souls are in them and they're alive. Allah responded to him. And by my might and by my greatness and loftiness, as long as they seek my forgiveness, I will wipe away their sins and your misguidance. This is what our beloved Prophet ﷺ has told us about our Creator and ourselves. Ya Allah, we ask your forgiveness. Ya Allah, you are the merciful, forgiving one. We ask your mercy and forgiveness. Ya Allah, if you do not forgive us and have mercy with us, we will have been lost. Ya Allah, we seek your forgiveness and mercy. Mercy. Ya Allah, we ask you to make us of those who are forgiving and merciful to those around us. Ya Allah, do not keep in our hearts a level of hate or disrespect or looking down on people. Ya Allah, make us forgiving and merciful and compassionate with others. Ya Allah, we ask you to make us of those who are deserving of your support and your help and your forgiveness and your guidance and answering of our prayers. Ya Allah, we ask you to forgive your ummah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and make us of those who are successful in this life and the hereafter. Wa aqimis salah wa sallillahu ala muhammad wa ala.